All right, so it's Tuesday morning, first day of fall, getting started on the day's activities. I had my breakfast already, some nice toast. And uh, the problem here is that, you know, it's been weeks and weeks of this. We're learning about loops, and uh, it just feels like, you know, in a typical semester, we'd all have gotten to know each other a bit better by now. It's the first day of fall. It's late September. We're sort of settled in. The, the novelty of this whole online thing is worn off, but it doesn't feel like we're all a family yet. So I don't, I don't know. Maybe we need, maybe I should tell you a bit about myself. So um, I got this Google map here of uh, the University of Victoria campus. This is the Engineering and Computer Science building. In my office, I somewhere in that area. It's not really that easy to tell from looking at a map. Uh, and uh, of course, the University of Victoria is located in scenic Victoria, BC. Some of you have not had a chance to visit Victoria yet. Uh, you know, there it is. Um, it's very nice, very nice this time of year, lots of great hikes and things, leaves all over the ground. And uh, Victoria is on the southern tip of an island called Vancouver Island. And hopefully all of you have the chance to come visit someday. And uh, I'm half Canadian, half American, and uh, on my mother's side, actually, my mother's side of the family, is from another place on Vancouver Island. And so uh, Victoria is down here on the southern tip of the island. And if we take a look up at the very uh, northern tip, I think the northernmost place is Port Hardy, which is up here. And um, so here's Victoria. And about halfway up, there is a city called Campbell River. And that is where my mother is from. And uh, that means, whoops, and that means that uh, on holidays or Thanksgiving or something, we would all hop in the car from Victoria and we would drive all the way up on Highway 1 and then uh, up on, um, no, I've actually, it's not even vi visible on the map, uh, on Highway 19, we drive all the way from, let's see if I can get it all in one place here, from Victoria, there it is, from Victoria all the way to Campbell River. And of course, as a kid, I don't think we drove over the water, as a kid, this felt like it took like 100 hours. Um, and I'm sure I was really annoying in the back of the car. I think these days when I drive up to Campbell River, it's actually sort of lots of fun. There's a point in your life when the drive becomes sort of relaxing, I, I guess. Um, and I go visit my grandma's house up in Campbell River. Now, some of you in this course are actually from Campbell River and very likely um, are still there. I mean, because everything's online, I don't know if you'd want to move to Victoria. So there's Campbell River. Let's see what we have in Campbell River here. Well, we've got... Um, Grizzly bear tours. I have no idea what that is. Sounds interesting, though. Lots of fishing happening up there, too. Um, and there's my grandma's house. I don't think I'm going to tell you where that is. But one of the things when I went to my grandma's house as a kid that was really interesting, I mean, obviously going to grandma's house was the most exciting thing in the world. One of the things that was really weird about going there was that if you wanted to have toast for breakfast, not indeed unlike the toast that I had this morning, if you wanted to have toast for breakfast at grandma's house, you had to make it on the stove because Grandma didn't really have a toaster. She had no interest in going and buying a toaster. If you wanted toast at Grandma's house, you would make toast on the stove. And as a kid, this was really fascinating to me, especially when I got old enough to actually make the toast on the stove myself. Um, and I, I know that that's, it's a hard image to, to put in your head, so I think I, I've got a little um, visualization here. So here's a stock photo of a stove. This is the kind of stove that Grandma had. It is not the same stove Grandma had. She would not approve of this dirty part here. But... Um, what you would do if you wanted to make toast on the stove is you would go to the cupboard and you'd get out one of those cooling racks that you, you know, used to cool off cookies when you bake them or something. And you just put it on top of the stove burner and it would sort of be, I don't know, sitting like that, basically. It's not a very good drawing. Um, and you'd put the piece of bread on top of that and you'd turn the stove on and it would glow red. And then you'd pay very careful attention because the bread would toast really quickly. And you'd have to reach in and, and avoid burning your hand to flip the bread over to toast the other side. And of course, I usually, when I was young, had to ask grandma to help me do this, but eventually I got to doing, being able to do it myself. But the thing about this is, it was of course fascinating, and the toast was so much better at grandma's house. Um, and I'm sure it was because it was made on the stove. People keep telling me, oh well, Bill, it was probably because it was grandma's homemade bread. Yeah, right, whatever, but it was made on the stove. That's the key thing. And uh, the problem with making toast on the stove, though, which I learned several times, I learned this lesson over and over again, is that if you don't pay perfect attention, you are going to set the toast on fire and it's gonna set off the smoke alarm. And that would often wake up grandpa and that wouldn't, that wouldn't be very nice. Uh, and uh, so the problem with this was that as a kid, not only do you have to pay 
full attention. You can't look at anything else. You get distracted for one second, that toast is already on fire. But also, you have to reach in and flip the toast over. Maybe it's worth it, but you have to devote your full attention to making that toast. Uh, and it takes a while to learn how to do it. And it takes a few times running and getting grandma to help before you get some confidence making toast on the stove yourself. So I don't know. Maybe that's an engineering problem. It's hard to tell. It's one thing, I don't, we're all talking about programming in this course, but maybe something to think about on the side is, is it better to make toast on the stove or on a toaster? And I think about this on days like this because today I made my toast in a toaster oven. In, in fact, the stove that I have where I live now isn't even this kind of stove, so I can't make toast on the stove. Um, and I use a toaster oven because I've, I guess I've gotten lazy and complacent as I've gotten older, and I don't really want to deal with that amount of stress in the morning, so I just put the toast in the toaster oven and it takes care of it for me. I don't need to have any expertise. Well, actually, okay, hold on. This is complicated. Let's just, um, I've made a pros and cons list. We'll go through this methodically. So if I make toast on the stove, obviously the biggest advantage, of course, is that that reminds me of grandma's house. Uh, your mileage may vary there. I don't know. Um, and uh, I guess the secondary advantage is that I get absolute control over that toasting process. I have complete control of every variable of how the toast is made, what angle the grill lines appear on it, everything. Uh, and I guess I can toast literally anything I want. Anything that I can stick on that rack above the stove, I can toast. I can toast things that, that, that humankind had no business ever trying to toast if I want to. You can't just cram literally anything into a toaster. But I could try and toast just about anything on the stove. But the problem, of course, with toasting things on the stove is you might start a fire. Okay, so that, that's, a, uh, that's a big one. It's not, it wasn't as big of a deal when I was a kid. For some reason when I was a kid, the idea that the house might catch fire didn't seem to bother me very much. These days it does sort of, it's beginning to worry me a bit. I don't know, maybe it's like paying for insurance or something. Suddenly it, it bothers me a bit that I might have to make an insurance claim. Uh, um, and I have to give my full attention to the toast. If I turn away for even one minute, even if I'm having a lousy morning, I'm really tired, if I'm making toast on the stove, I better be watching it because if I turn away, the toast is going to catch fire and then maybe wake up grandpa, maybe the house burns down. None of that's a good idea. Um, and I guess there's also that um, if you haven't made toast on the stove before, it's a bit of an acquired skill. Um, and I learned this because last year, for uh, briefly, I lived at a place that did have one of those stoves while I was uh, in the process of moving between places. And uh, I tried making toast on the stove and it, it burnt, like uh, it, was, it was a complete disaster. I had to have cereal for, for breakfast uh, that day. So it turns out that you need a bit of, of skill making toast to be able to make toast on the stove. And that's why in my, as I've gotten older, I've gotten complacent and I use a toaster or a toaster oven. Maybe I can try and just, I know you've been thinking, Bill, you sold out. This is ridiculous. Come on. What happened to your dreams? I, I think about that too sometimes. Maybe I can justify this to you. So first, okay, this is wrong. Grandma might not approve. Grandma would be proud of me no matter what I do. So we'll, this is, of course, false. Um, I can't toast weirdly shaped things. Now, this isn't as big of a deal now that I'm an adult. I, I don't know. I mostly like toasting bread now. It's not as exciting to toast weird stuff. Um, I don't get as much control over the toast, but you, you know, to be honest, on a typical morning, I just want toast. I, I don't want a deal. Uh, so the lack of control, not a big deal. Um, don't set off the smoke alarm. This is a big one, especially now in the, in the segment of my life that I've spent living in apartment buildings and things. Setting off the smoke alarm when you're at grandma's house is, is a tough one, but everybody's family there. We're, we're all used to working things out. Setting off the smoke alarm in an apartment building is pretty embarrassing for so many different reasons. Um, so better not to, to do that if we can avoid it. Um, but the big one, I think, about using a toaster, the advantage of it is that you don't need to know literally anything about how to make toast to use a toaster. You go to the store, you buy a toaster, you don't care what it does. You put the bread in, you push the thing down, and then toast comes out a couple of minutes later. Now, I mean, you probably realize that it's using electricity to generate heat and the heat to toast the bread. But think about it. Do you care? Would it make the toast any worse if you didn't know that? Would you be any worse at making toast with a toaster if you didn't know how it worked? No. That's the point of a small appliance. You go buy it, you put the bread in, and then it makes toast. Bread goes in, toast comes out. I think if we're talking about this from an engineering standpoint, this is the biggest deal. 
Bread goes in, toast comes out. We do not want to have to know everything about all of the parts of our machinery that we're using. Maybe if we're trying to make a meal, we want to focus on the high-level details. I think that's true of any other engineering problem as well, not just the problem of engineering breakfast. Bread goes in, toast comes out. You don't need to know anything about how it works, or in fact, need to know that much about what toast is to be able to use a toaster. I can just say, here, you may have never have heard of toast before in your life, and I can say, here's a piece of bread, put it in the toaster, press the button, and, and a couple minutes later, you've got toast. I think that's a, that's a big advantage, and also not burning the house down. Um, that, that said, those of you that are from Campbell River can ask me about this in the office hours, but it is worth considering that one of my more recent visits to Campbell River, I stayed in a hotel, because there comes a point where you don't want to afflict your relatives with your presence too much. I stayed in a hotel, and I went, and it was a, one of the famous Campbell River hotels, and uh, I went to the hotel breakfast, and I was very disappointed that they did not let me make toast on the stove, even though I think that should be a Campbell River tradition. They instead had a toaster at the hotel breakfast, and I put some toast in the hotel breakfast toaster and I, I don't want to get into the details but it, I set off a fire alarm and the fire department showed up and uh, I, I, I it was so it was the most embarrassing thing in the world it was hard to even go back to Campbell River after that but I certainly can never go back to that hotel after that it was just too embarrassing um, so that's one thing to think about if any of you worked at that hotel and you have a story about that guy that set off a, a fire alarm at the hotel breakfast that was me I'm so sorry you can talk to me about that in the office hours if you want um Oh, right, yeah, so we're supposed to be talking about programming this morning, too. I got a bit carried away. Um, okay, so uh, here's a, an exercise. I think this should scream loop exercise once you take a look at it. So this exercise is, here's a polynomial. Here's a, a function f, um, and we'll, I'll write it out in nice mathematical-looking notation. So f of x equals x squared plus 2x plus 5. And the task here is evaluate this polynomial on x equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 10. That's it. And you might look at this and say, OK, so we could just print out the value over and over by copying and pasting. And by now, we are so over this. I mean, obviously, we need a loop here. In fact, even I gave up copying and pasting after four because I know that we're, we're so far past this, we're not even going to entertain the idea of actually copying and pasting. And of course, the reason we want to turn this into a loop is that it avoids redundancy. It's no good to have the same code over and over because what if there's a bug? What if you want to change it? What if later I said, I don't want x squared, I want x cubed? Well, if you only have the formula in one place, then it's pretty easy to, um, oh, I pasted something. It's pretty easy to modify it there to, from x squared to x cubed. If you have copied and pasted the formula, that's really annoying and it's error prone. So of course we know the solution here would be to use some kind of loop. I could do this with either a for loop or a while loop. I guess um, I'm feeling more in, in a while loop mood this morning. So let's see, uh, well, x value is less than or equal to 10. I will print out uh, these two things. I will compute the formula for the polynomial, whoops, and I will uh, print it out. And then at the bottom, I will add my incrementation, x value equals x value plus 1. And that allows me to clean up this stuff. And of course, the other advantage here is that if I want to go up to 100 now, I just modify one thing. I'm keeping my code compact. I'm keeping everything in one place. I am avoiding, to the best extent possible, any duplication. So we'll try compiling that. Looks good. And we'll try running that. Uh, and there it all is. So I'm evaluating from x equals 1 up to x equals 10. Now, it turns out that this uh, idea of using a polynomial is foreshadowing the thing I really want to get to today. Um, but uh, it's worth, like I said on the first day of class, it's worth trying to prove that we need the new feature I'm about to introduce. And this is a, a place where it might have been useful, the thing I'm about to talk about, but we were able to get around it. I was using a loop to avoid all this redundancy. This looks pretty good. And if I now introduce a new feature, you'll say, Bill, I don't need that new feature. I was able to clean my code up just fine using a loop. And that's right. We shouldn't need new toys if the stuff we already know can do the trick. So here, I avoided redundancy. I condensed my code down to a relatively compact form, and I was able to do it using only a loop. But we should consider that the reason a loop was so helpful was that the task I was doing was fairly organized. I'm stepping through values of x that are counting, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 10. Or if I was doing, you know, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, up to 20 or something, a loop would help me for that. But I have a second version of this problem. 
and it uses a more complicated polynomial um, to help me prove a different point later, but I'll write it out over here. f of xy equals 6x squared plus 10 over y plus 17. And um, this isn't, the fact that it's a polynomial and two variables shouldn't scare us too much. We should know that there's nothing really that exciting about that. Uh, we should also know that we are very used to seeing this kind of definition of a polynomial in math, we, or any other kind of function. We define a function so that later we can refer to it. We can say, I want the value of f that you would get at f1, 2. And we understand that if I ask things like that, or f of 10, 6, if I write something like this in math, what I really mean is, well, okay, the first thing I give f is something called x, which means 10 is going to take the place of x, and 6 is going to take the place of y. But think about the fact that you've been using functions in math, and there is this distinction between when you define the function, when you describe what it does, versus when you use the function, when you um, uh, leverage that calculation in some other context. So in this program, I have this function of two uh, arguments. And I'm evaluating it on three values, a three xy pairs. I guess I'll compile and run this and we can take a look at it. But unlike my previous example, uh, the exact xy pairs that I'm using don't seem to have any pattern. x equals 1, y equals 2. x equals 4, y equals 5. x equals 0, y equals 3. They're sort of arbitrary. There isn't any way I can think of of condensing this down into a loop. I just need three completely arbitrary evaluations of my function. And so my first try was I just copy and paste. I keep writing the formula out over and over again. And maybe I can get away with that if I'm doing it three times, but if I wanted to evaluate this function on 10 different inputs, that would be pretty painful. And it would also be a maintainability hazard. We want to program to save people time. Not just to save time having to plug in numbers to formulas, but to save time having to fix bugs or modify code. And if we're copying and pasting our code over and over again and there's a bug in it, we're going to have a really nightmarish uh, debugging process to fix that bug everywhere and not make another mistake in the process of doing that. So we need something here. And I believe this example is sufficient to prove to you that a loop won't do the trick. A loop just doesn't do the thing that we need. What we want is the ability to package stuff up sort of like we do in math. So um, in math, if I wanted to evaluate the function three times, I would literally write, okay, give me f of 1, 2. Give me f of 4, 5. Give me f of uh, 0, 3. And if I decide later to change f, I just go change it up here. If, I make, if I'm keeping some notes or I'm describing a mathematical process, I don't need to keep rewriting the whole formula. And if you ever had to rewrite a formula over and over on paper, you know how, how tedious and painful that can be and how easy it is to make a mistake because you can't always remember it. So we want the same ability in C. But there's a second advantage of this notation, which is consider for a moment um, this is a polynomial, f of xy. What if I define a function that's really complicated, that we don't really want to worry about? Um, isn't it nice that once I've defined the function, so I'll actually do it in abstract here. I'll say, okay, here's a function, and it's something, don't try and remember this. I'm, I'm just making something stupid up here. Um, it's something like, I don't know, i equals 1 up to 1,000 of uh, <laughs> something horrifying like this. Um, so what if there's a function whose formula is incredibly horrifying? And we'll just cross that out to remember that we don't actually have to know this. The key is that once you've defined the function, you can keep using it over and over again, and you never really have to worry about how it works. And I think the best example of this is you probably find yourself these days using trigonometry for a lot of things. In fact, you often plug in uh, various trigonometric things into your calculator. You have a value x, and you ask the calculator to give you sine x. And you never really have to care that much how sine x is computed. You type a value in, you press the sign button, and you get sine x. You might need to use sine x for something, but do you really care how we get the value of sine x? It turns out that the calculator is using some algorithm to do it, but do you care? Well, no. 
The reason functions are so helpful in math is that once we've defined it, if you know what sine x is, you never really have to care how we get it. You know that there's this magic box. Your calculator has this ability to give you sine x. You don't care how. And the sine function is an example of something mysterious, but I think the same thing sort of happens for this polynomial in this program. I give it a value x and a value y, and once I've defined the polynomial, I don't really care what the formula is. I just use it over and over again. I like that freedom. I like that I don't have to worry about everything. What I've done is I've packaged up some math, some behavior, into a small appliance. And once I have a small appliance, I give it a value of x and y, and out comes the computed result. Bread goes in, toast comes out. That is our goal. In this course, we want to make our code modular. We want to avoid having to worry about too many things at once. I want to have my toast getting made while I go and make coffee. I don't want to have to keep staring at every part of my code because it's about to catch fire. So what we want is this kind of modularity. Once I've decided that I need to use something over and over again, like a formula like this, I want to package it up into a box like, whoops, a box like this so that I can use it over and over again with confidence. So we have the idea that bread goes in, toast comes out. If we can design a good small appliance, we can get that in C code. Uh, I want to just make sure that I haven't broken my code because I just pasted something weird into it. Um, oh, whoops. There we go. All right. So what I'm going to do in this video is talk about, um, I guess at first, I want to just talk about this idea of packaging up behavior. If you scroll down on the page you're on, there are a whole bunch of other videos talking about each of these individual pieces of this technique of how to use functions in C. C has a feature called functions that are very similar to functions in mathematics, but with a lot of extra notation. This is one point in the course where we're going to need terminology because of all the different facets of how a function works. And we can think about that in math too. In math, if I want to define a function, I write something like this. So 6x squared plus 10 over y plus 17. I am defining a function that you can use again. Later, when I actually use the function, so if I write something like f of 10 comma 6 in math, what I mean is go get that function you had earlier and then sub in 10 for x and 6 for y. Evaluate that formula. In C, we do still call this thing a definition, but we call this thing a call. When we use the function, we are calling the function. And we'll spend a lot, we'll have lots of fun later going through examples of tracing code that has functions. But for now, I want to go over the basic idea of how we define a function. So I'm going to go up here. When, the first thing you'll notice is when we define one of these functions, we define it outside of main. It exists independent of the rest of the program, which means we can use it over and over again. It's not tied to any specific piece of your code. So what I want to do is first, I want to set up this box called f. It'll have a name so I know which function I'm using. And the box is going to take some data from the outside world, and we'll call those arguments or parameters. And we'll come back to that later, that, that uh, definition. And f is going to perform some calculation and then send something back to me. So conceptually, that means if I say, give me the value of f 10 comma 6. What I'm doing is I'm providing f with two values. Maybe we'll call them x and y. And I suppose in c, it's important that, we, that they are double, because we, we care a lot about types. I provide f with these values. Some, the values rattle around inside of f. Some calculation happens happens, but the person using f doesn't even care what calculation that is. And then f sends something back. So that, for example, if I, if I had written something like, um, if I had written something like uh, 7 times f of 10 comma 6, well, I, I compute the value of f and then I multiply that by 7. So I, I give f the value 10 and the value 6, they rattle around inside, and then I get back whatever f actually produced. f sends something back to me so that I can use it in my calculation. We call this returning a value. Um, I need to learn to spell uh, returns a value. And maybe we care that the value that the function returns has a specific type. So what I'm going to do up here above main is I'm going to write out what's called a function signature. And if you scroll down a bit, you'll see the notes talk about this in great detail because function signatures are a really big deal. They are the reason that we can treat functions like small appliances. 
If you go to the store and you buy a toaster, you don't care how it works inside. You care that you put bread in and then it makes toast. The same thing is true of a function. Bread goes in, toast comes out. And we have to define this properly so that somebody that uses the function understands what to send in. So I'm going to write out the full signature and then describe it briefly, and then another video will describe it in more detail. Okay, so here's my function signature. And the pieces of the signature are, uh, to be quick about it, these are the arguments. And I list them and I give their types. And every argument must have a type and a name. And I'm going to call the first argument x. And that means if you call the function f, the first thing you send in will become x. I'm going to call the second thing y. So the second thing you send in will become y. Um, you might notice in main, when you declare variables, you could write x value comma y value. You can declare multiple variables with one type. In a function signature, every single argument must have its own type fully written out. So I couldn't just write x comma y here. I'd have to do double x comma double y. So this information inside the brackets is, what does the function need from the outside world? This is the name of the function. A function can have any name you want. Um, the same rules for naming variables apply. And this is the return type of the function. When the function is done, what does it send back? And then inside these curly brackets is the function body. And you know already that we have this idea of scope and these curly brackets do pertain to that. We'll see that in a future video. Inside the function body, every time somebody wants to use the function and they send in values of x and y, the function body gets run. And when the function is done and computed its result, it returns that result, at which point the function ends and we go back to whoever asked for the result, whoever called the function. So here, I'm going to do this in a way that is a bit longer than we need. I'm going to declare a variable called result. I'm going to say result equals, okay, so what was the polynomial again? It was 6 times x times x plus 10 over y plus 17. And then I return my result. Now, to be clear, I could also write for the entire function, return 6 times x times x plus 10 over y plus 17. A return statement basically says compute the final number that occurs on the right hand side. In this case, it's just the value of this variable, but it could also be a formula like this. Compute the final number and then return that out of the function. The function ends and it sends back this number to the outside world. Okay, so this is a fully formed function definition, beginning with its function signature. You often hear a function signature called sometimes a prototype or a declaration. We'll see later that those terms are actually a little bit inaccurate. So I like to say this thing, which is at the beginning of every function definition, is the function signature. It tells you, a member of the outside world, all you should need to know about how to use that function. What goes in and what comes out. And obviously, I guess, you know, the name of the function. All right, so um, I'm going to clear this. And actually, let's compile to make sure I haven't made a mistake. Okay, that looks good. And then down here, where I was previously just using the formula myself, I can now call my function. And how do we call a function? Well, we type the name of the function, then some brackets, and then the things to pass in as its arguments. So x value comma y value. Now, to be clear, I could also write f of 1 comma 2. I, be, between the brackets and the commas, I could put any expression 4 times 4 plus 7 over no, whatever. I can put any numerical expression I want. It doesn't have to be something called x. And you might notice, in main, I call my variable x value. Whereas in my function f, the argument it actually receives is just called x. And that's significant. And we'll see that in future videos. We'll talk about how that, uh, what the implications are of that on tracing. I'm going to clear that out. OK, so the same thing down here. I've got f of x value comma y value. And actually here, I'm going to show that we can short circuit things. Why bother having variables for this? I could just do f of 0 comma 3. So we'll try that. And oh, maybe I should have shown that that has the same output as before. I guess I already lost my previous output. You could rewind the video to verify that these are the same numbers that I had a minute ago. Uh, and so what I've done is, I guess, a pretty basic example of taking a bit of repetitive behavior and packaging it up. Once I've packaged it up, I no longer have to worry about, oh, did I get the formula correct? Well, hey, that was your problem up here. That isn't your problem down in main. Once you've created that box, then stuff goes in and stuff comes out. If I've defined f correctly, I can use f a million different times, and every time it will work exactly the same way. If there is a bug in f, I only have to fix it in one place. So the 
idea is going forward, we're going to see that we that our code is just strewn with these small appliances. If we notice that we do something repeatedly, we package it up into a small appliance, we test it to make sure that it works, and then we never have to worry about it again. We can just use it over and over again. Bread goes in, toast comes out.